miracles because I believe in God. And I believe in the person and the power of God Almighty with every atom of my being. Well, sir, today I'm going to talk to you about the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you want to know something? Theoretically, tens of thousands of people honor the Holy Spirit every Sunday morning when they sing the doxology in their places of worship. And yet, there are thousands who know absolutely nothing about the person of the Holy Spirit. They know absolutely nothing about the power of the Holy Spirit. You would be amazed how many folk sing the doxology every Sunday morning when they attend their place of worship. And yet, whenever they think of the Holy Spirit, they think of him as just an influence or perhaps one of the attributes knowing nothing about this wonderful person who is literally the power of the Trinity. And then, of course, there are those who are just beginning to become acquainted with this glorious personality. And they feel as though they have just discovered a new thing. This wonderful new personality who has just come on the scene. They feel as though they have made a marvelous discovery. A person who has never really been active in power before. And yet, do you want to know something? The Holy Spirit. This wonderful third person, the Trinity, has existed since eternity. And it's just like that. You go back to the beginning of time. Go back, if you will, please. When the great plan of salvation was laid out, me thinks the three were at that great conference table, and I like to think of it as the greatest conference table that the world has ever known. And the three were present. How do I know? Because at that time, when they were laying out the plan, for man's salvation, for your redemption, for my redemption. Jesus offered himself through the Holy Spirit to God the Father to be given. Oh, I know, as a little child in Sunday school, the very first scripture you learned was John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But beloved, before God could give his son, Jesus, the son of the living God, offered himself through the Holy Spirit to be given by the Father. They were all three there. You cannot separate the Son from the Father, neither can you separate the Father from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, Jesus Christ is God, and God the Father is God. All three have existed from eternity. And Jesus at that great conference table said, all right, I'll go. I'll become as much man as though I was not deity and divinity. 
I'll go. I'll take the form of flesh. And turning to the Holy Spirit, and knowing the matchless power of the Holy Spirit, he said, I'll go. Knowing your power, I'll depend on you for that glorious power of service. And he offered himself, the word of God says, through the Holy Spirit to be given to the Father. And the Father gave his only begotten Son. If only our poor little puny minds could fathom all that was involved when they laid the plans for man's redemption. And Father God, knowing his only begotten Son, trusted in him, knowing, knowing that he would be true to that trust. And Jesus came. This is something so very thrilling. Through it all, watch the Holy Spirit and the involvement of the Holy Spirit. The very first that we have of the Holy Spirit, this wonderful personality, this glorious power of the Trinity, taking this active part in redemption's plan is recorded in the first chapter of Matthew. Here it is. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. All of this was in God's wonderful redemptive plan. It was just the body of Mary, the physical body of Mary, that encompassed that remarkable thing, that great miracle conceived of the Holy a little further, something that I think is most thrilling. It's recorded in the third chapter of Matthew. It's at that hour when Jesus comes out of the waters of baptism. Oh, I have read it. I have wept over it. The pages of my Bible are worn and torn. It's so precious to me. And Jesus, when he was baptized, get it, he is now coming up out of the waters of baptism. Went straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And low voice from heaven saying, This is 
my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Again, we have the three persons united. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the three who sat at this great conference table and mapped out the wonderful plan of redemption the wonderful plan of man's salvation. Again, they are reunited. The first time that we see the three together, since Jesus offered himself to the Holy Spirit, to God the Father to be given for man's redemption. And in this moment, coming up out of the waters of baptism, we see the Holy Spirit, the glorious power of the Trinity, descending upon Jesus, equipping him for a very definite purpose, for there was a great ministry ahead. There was a marvelous ministry ahead. And things were running on schedule, even as they had planned. And the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus, equipping him with power for service. And in that same moment, a voice. Whether anyone heard of that voice except the Son, I do not know. It was the voice of God himself saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Follow me very closely. Remember something. When Jesus came, he was as much man as though he were not God. It had to be so. For he has known every temptation that any human being has ever known. He could not be a rightful judge. And one day, he will be our judge. He'll be your judge. One day, when life is all over, and we stand in his glorious presence. Jesus is the one who's going to be your judge. He's going to be my judge. And how could he be a righteous judge? Had he not suffered the same temptations that you have suffered, the same temptations that I have suffered. And that's the reason I say to you those temptations were real. Don't let anybody tell you that those temptations were not real that Jesus suffered. When the enemy of his soul came to him, when the evil one, when the devil came with those temptations, those temptations were real and he could have yielded to those temptations. Had he not been able to yield to those temptations, then they would have been a both the devil knew and Jesus knew that he could have yielded to those temptations for he was as much man as though he were not God and as much God as though he were not man here is something that's marvelous the hour came for service. The father was trusting his son to carry through. The Holy Spirit came through as planned. We talk about the wonderful miracles in the ministry of Jesus. We thrill to those glorious ministries that Jesus had, but watch. There is a secret that has been overlooked. The secret 
of the power in the life of Jesus was found in the person of the Holy Spirit. Read, if you will, please. In the ninth chapter of Acts, you know, you've taken this precious book. It's been on your shelf, lo, these many years. Why don't you get it out and read it? It's one thing, you know, to have me to read these things to you. But it's another thing for you to have your own Bible. This is the very word of God. Before Jesus performed any miracle whatsoever, something happened. And this was the secret of the power in the earthly ministry of Jesus. And the secret is found in this 38th verse. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. And with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. What was the secret of power in the ministry of Jesus? These miracles that Jesus did while he walked this earth. He knew. Jesus knew the secret of his power. It was no mystery to him. When he came up out of the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. He was filled with the glorious power of the Holy Spirit. Then followed a matchless ministry. And the word tells us that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he knew the secret of that power. Jesus talked very confidentially to his own one day. It's recorded in John. He said, you know, I'm going away. It is expedient for you, it is necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. And when he is come, he will magnify me. He has great power, convicting power. He'll convict the world of sin and of judgment to come. He talked very freely of a personality, not just an influence, not just one of the attributes, but of a personality constantly referring to him. He shall convict the world of sin and of judgment to come. He will magnify me. The Holy Spirit, a definite person with a very definite personality. So important was the coming of the Holy Spirit Go back and read it in your own precious word. He's about to leave now. He's standing there. He's going away. He knew the fickleness of human beings. Jesus knew. of men and women. He understood, he knew. But he also knew the power of the person, the Holy Spirit. 
and his very last words, knowing that he was leaving a few men and women with his wonderful task, his unfinished task, the last words that he said before he went away, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The same wonderful power that you've seen manifested in my ministry, this wonderful demonstration of power that you've seen with your own eyes, you've seen, you've experienced, I want you to know that I'm leaving you, not alone, but when I am gone, I'm going to send him to you, this same wonderful third person of Trinity, this same wonderful power of the Trinity. I'm going to send him, this person who's been the secret of the power in my life and my ministry. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. He came. Oh, in that upper room, live it and read it. I have a thousand times over in the second chapter of Acts. It was even as Jesus said it would be. He has never given us an untruth, never. And then that upper room, something happened. Things are still going on schedule and we know that Jesus made it back to the Father's throne. We know that Jesus is at this very moment in position of great high priest. We know that he's at the right hand of God the Father. He made it back to glory because he said when he arrived, he would send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit came. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. The same Holy Spirit who descended upon Jesus as he came up out of the waters of baptism came upon those believers in that upper room. Power for what purpose? Why was the Holy Spirit given? For one purpose and one purpose only. For service. for service. You and I are saved to serve. Not one of us ought to live a defeated Christian life, not for one moment. He's made ample provision for power. He has made ample provision for victory. through the person of the Holy Spirit. Everything that Jesus had as he walked to the shores of Galilee is ours today. He made that provision. Everything they had in the early church is ours today. And that is what Zechariah meant when he cried forth, it's not by might, 
It's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Watch, beloved, what we need in our churches today is not more organization. What we need is not bigger and better church edifices. What we need is not more and better learned men behind our pulpits. What we need in our churches today is the power of the Holy Spirit. What you as a Christian need in that life of yours this hour is the power of the Holy Spirit. For it's the Holy Spirit alone who'll give the results. Father God, please, Teach us regarding this wonderful third person, the Trinity, and give us that power in the pulpit, in our churches, and in our individual lives for Jesus' sake. I believe in miracles. with all of my heart. And I have to believe in miracles. I see them happening around me every day of my life. But I believe in miracles because I believe in God. I want to dedicate the telecast today to the memory of a woman whose life influenced the lives of thousands and thousands of people through the years. I never met this wonderful lady. I deeply regret that I never met her. And yet, I feel as though I've known her all of my life. And perhaps no one in the whole world living today appreciates her ministry, appreciates this woman more than the one who's speaking to you now. She too, a woman preaching the gospel. She too, a woman who believed in miracles. She too was a woman who had dedicated her life to Jesus. She too was a woman who loved lost souls. Perhaps no one living could fully understand the loneliness that she went through in her life better than I. For a life that's dedicated to the Lord is sometimes a very lonely life. It can be so lonely. There are the thousands of people around you. You've stood before them for hours, giving every ounce of strength that you have in your body. 
Sometimes you feel as though your legs won't hold you up any longer. And you give and you give and you give every ounce of strength that there is in your body. And then you go home. You wish you had given a little more, had there been a little more to give. Your heart aches for those that you couldn't reach or those who were not healed. When you love souls, it's the heaviest burden in the world to carry. Though I've never seen this woman, I share the loneliness and the consecration and her fellowship with him. And now, the voice of the lovely lady of whom I have been speaking, millions have heard her voice. Here it is. We have no need to doubt God. God lives. God's word is true. God's word has been proven. Angela Temple with this great multitude here tonight, filled uh, with hearts that know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Say amen. amen. Know Jesus Christ as their healer. Amen. Know Christ as the baptizer with the Holy Ghost. And believe in the coming of the Lord. Oh, thank God for the power of faith. And that was the voice of Amy Semple McPherson. My guest today, the daughter and the son of this great lady with a great faith in a great God. Thank you. 
Yes, today, I'll be daughter and the son of Amy Semple McPherson, Roberta. <laughs> oh, anyone who knew Amy Semple McPherson knew about her lovely young daughter, Roberta, who was affectionately known as Bertie, who is now Mrs. Harry Salter, and Ms. McPherson's son, Rolf, who is today Dr. Rolf McPherson. Oh, I tell you, I don't think anybody in the whole world was any more proud of her children than your mother was proud of the two of you. I suppose you realized that when you were children. Did you really? Oh, I think so. We really enjoyed being <laughs> the children that we were. I guess that's true. And you know, I did something that... Um, Oh, I just love it. No one ever looked at these pictures and enjoyed them any more than I've enjoyed them. Here is one. Let's take the first one. Here's your mother. And, uh, Roberta, there you are, the great big hair ribbon in your hair. When I looked at that, I smiled because I can produce some pictures too with a hair ribbon equally as large. Do, do you remember when this was taken? Oh, yes, indeed. And I remember those sailor suits. We had... Two suits apiece, Rolf and I. Two dark ones for the winter and two white ones for the summer. And that was our uniform, so no one ever knew we had no other clothes. And it worked out very well. You mean you, you just didn't have? We didn't have. All we lived out of the missionary barrel. But these, these were our formal school going out clothes. Rolf, you remember? Our home for the first six years was our car and a little tent that we pitched by the road, so you couldn't carry very many clothes along. But those were wonderful years, weren't they? Oh, they were exciting years. Sure. And, and Roberta, you, you uh, were born after the death of your father. My father died one month before I was born in Hong Kong, China. And mother was a widow, under 20, with a brand new baby, and stranded 12,000 miles from home. Just consider that. Consider your mother not only had faith, your mother was not only a great woman of faith, your mother was a great woman of courage. But wait a moment. Before we go out in there, I just remembered. When I was born, she was alone there. She hadn't even the fare to, to go home to her mother, and she didn't have money for the funeral for my father. They were penniless babies in the woods. But when she opened, a letter came the next day, she opened that letter, and it said, Dear Sister McPherson, Dear Sister Semple, that was yes. the name then, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and said, Send Sister Semple some money. She said, Well, all I have is $60. She said, Send it. She said, I'll do it tomorrow. She said, No, get out of bed, put the money in an envelope, and send it. Money gets stolen. The Lord's voice said, very clearly, she says, I will take care of that money. The money arrived in China the day after my father died. And mother had money for funeral services and a little money to begin to live. A telegram then came from my grandmother, of course, with cable money to come home. But miracles do happen in strange ways. And you were that little tiny baby. Think of it, Roberta. You were that little tiny baby born to a young widow, only 20 years of age, in Hong Kong, China, alone. At that point, you're right. She could have quit. But she had the courage to she go on. She could have quit. She could have quit. Do you realize simple. that your mother could have quit over and over and over again? I think the two of you know the courage of your mother better than anyone else in the whole world. Right, Rolf? We sure do. We traveled day by day with her, and we felt like the children of Israel. <laughs> uh, we didn't know what was going to happen the next day, but the Lord always provided. And your mother uh, had, uh, do you remember those days of the tent? I surely do. Uh, we enjoyed traveling in those tents, but our home was the little tent, and the storms that broke overhead, the lightning would flash right through the canvas, and the rain would come through too, and mother would sit by the cot, and tell us Bible stories, holding an umbrella over us to keep us dry. Well, <laughs> really? Oh, absolutely. 
And, and, she, and she was always, uh, everything was bright and cheerful so far as she was concerned. Well, things were a game. I mean, she made us feel this was the world. If we had a little simple tent, she showed us the dew on the, on the uh, grass. Or showed it, or we hung our Christmas presents. I had a ball and jack this Christmas. And I think you got a jackknife. But they, they were tied onto a cactus bush on, on, the, <laughs> on the beach at uh, Palm Spring. No, Palm, Palm Beach. You could have bought any acreage there you wanted then for $3 an acre. But we didn't have $3. And that's all that you got for Christmas. That's right. All right. And your mother always dressed in, in white uniforms. How in the world did she get those uniforms uh, 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 laundry? Well, first of all, the reason she wore the white uniform was she couldn't afford an expensive dress. And that was really a white maid's uniform. With, with oh, the cape put on sure. like the Red Cross nurses had. But when she rode into town, she had to have a clean uniform for the next church service. Mm -hmm. She stopped by the roadside and washed it in a stream, hung it out to dry. And Rolf and I went out looking for berries or for something to, to nibble on over the sidelines or played in the rolling down the hills. And then when it was dry, she ironed it, using for the ironing board the back seat of the car. And when she arrived in town, she was beautiful and dazzling. You would have thought she had 10,000 maids at home. <laughs> But she did it herself, and she always said, don't be a preacher unless you really want to work. Ah. Unless you love the Lord enough to, to scrub the floor and dust the pews. And and no one ever knew. No one ever saw behind the scenes, did no, they? No. no one ever knew when you were hungry. That's right. The Lord knew, and he provided. Sometimes Mother had given away the very last money that she had and was praying, Lord, if you want us to eat, you'll have to supply it. If you want us to fast, we'll do that. <laughs> And then just about that time would come a knock on the door and somebody with a basket of food over their arm say, the Lord spoke to me while I was cooking dinner today and said, prepare some for the evangelist and her children. And they came looking for us. Tell about that. What was it? Shoes once? Shoes? You, you had to have shoes and, and you always got what was out of the missionary bale, right? Right. Some folks had sent a barrel of clothes to the south where Mother was ministering and They'd forgotten. It was six months <laughs> since I was there, and I'd grown. Sure, children <laughs> grow. The shoes didn't fit. They were too small. And my sister had the answer. What'd well, you do? Mother, Mother was telling us the story that night <laughs> before she went to preach. Our bedtime story about the children of Israel crossing 40 years of the desert. And, of course, like a kid, I said, uh, well, in 40 years, didn't their feet grow? Hmm. And she said, yeah, of course. She was in a hurry to get on her way, and they were playing the first hymn in the big tent. And I said, but really, Mother, how did, how did uh, they keep the shoes on their feet? And she was a little bit impatient for once in her life, and she said, oh, I suppose God stretched them. <laughs> and, but I wouldn't <laughs> stop there. I said, let's pray to God to stretch Rolf's shoes. And kind of shamefacedly, I must admit, she got down and joined us in our prayer. Now, I don't know what happened. Whether Rolf's feet shrunk, <laughs> or whether the Lord sets the shoes, but in the morning they fit just fine. And you wore right, the shoes. Right. God supplied wonderfully for us. Our lives were filled with miracles. You were brought up on miracles, and it was the way of living with her. Do you remember seeing your mother cry? Yes, there were times that things, like any woman, there were tears, but they never stopped her. She'd get up and wash her face, put a little dust of powder on her nose, and go into the pulpit. And stand and in front of the whole crowd? Absolutely. No one ever knew. Ever knew the burden she was carrying. Right. Or the heartbreak. Once as she was just about to go into one of these meetings, she was preparing for the tent meeting and she had a carbide lamp and it exploded right in her face and burned her face very badly. And here the crowd was gathering and she just didn't know what to do. But finally she went into that service and began to preach and the Lord healed her as she preached, and she just began to praise the Lord, and everybody joined in rejoicing with her. And before that service was over, she was absolutely made whole again. Thank God for her courage. Ralph, do you know that now the International Church of the Four Square Gospel is celebrating its 50th anniversary, right? Yes, it What is. if your mother had given up? Roberta, what, when she was left a widow over there in Hong Kong, had she given up? God would have sent somebody else to do the job. He would have gotten the job done all right. But there were so many times that all of us could quit. That's right. One more step. 
That's right. They'll take us on our way. Rob, how many churches now? After all of these years, and your mother's... And there were those who said, oh, when Amy Semple McPherson goes, the whole thing will collapse. She's been gone, but how many churches continue? What, Rob? From that first church, there are now thousands of churches scattered around the world. Twenty-seven countries were preaching the gospel, and the work is growing day by day. It's stronger than it's ever been. Right. And this convention is going to bring people from all of these nations to this great convention. Uh, one young man that's coming, we're very happy that he's going to be with us, but he was the son of a family of cannibals in New Guinea. And he went eight years of age, we reached him with the gospel, and mm -hmm. his life was changed. He's a grown man now, and one of our leading ministers, he's coming to speak at our convention. I said a few minutes ago, I never had the privilege of having met this wonderful woman, not only of faith, but of great courage. But one day, long before I ever had a ministry in Los Angeles, Maggie was with me. We were driving through forest lawn. And as we were slowly driving down the roads, I suddenly saw this beautiful monument erected to the memory of Amy Semple McPherson. I was driving. I said, Maggie, I want to stop the car. And we walked slowly up to the beautiful monument. Someone else had arrived before we arrived. A lady was standing there. I couldn't really tell you how old. Just standing there, and the tears were streaming down her face, and by her side was a young man about 17 years of age. I assumed it was her son. I can tell you exactly what the two looked like. She was talking to the young man. He was just standing there with his head bowed, listening to every word. I came close enough that I could hear what she was saying. And she said, you know, if only you had known her, she was the one who led me to Jesus Christ. And then she wiped the falling tears, and he would continue to listen. Oh, she said when she preached, she made Jesus so real to men and women. I found Christ through the ministry of this woman. I turned away. I found myself just wiping the tears away from my own cheeks. And I walked in silence to the car and I looked up and said oh God if after I would have lived my last day here on earth if after I've done my last day's work if I should go before the great rapture before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ if just one person could stand by my grave and say, I found Christ as my Savior because this woman lived, then I too will have lived a successful life. If just one person would have 
bound Christ through my life, then believe me, the heartbreak and the sorrows and the disappointments and the misunderstandings of the world will mean nothing whatsoever. It will have been a price worth it. Wonderful partner and family, you have just seen one of the newly digitized, life-changing messages. Many messages like this are being digitized today from the 80s and the 90s, including crusades and this is your day programs and so much more. And we want to show you more and more of them to bless your life, to strengthen you in the Lord that your walk will be strong in these days where we need to hear the word of God. These messages and crusades were so anointed by the Lord and that anointing is still on them. And we wanna bring them to you. But I need your help. I need your help because to digitize these amazing sermons, teaching, crusades, and so much more costs a lot of money. You've given already some of that money, thank you from all my heart, I say, but we have digitized already hundreds of them, but there's hundreds more still need to be digitized. Would you consider today to help us bring you many more messages that will really bless not only this generation, but many generations to come. Our children, grandchildren will be, will be blessed by them because the Lord, I believe, will use that blessed word that was preached and taught back in the 80s and the 90s Let's do it for his glory today. So you can give right now on the platform you're watching me on, or you can simply go to our website, benin.org, or simply text. Whatever amount you give will help us keep doing what we began to do months ago, and we want to do more and more and more for the glory of our precious Jesus. And that is in, in addition to all that I do live. Because my aim and my one desire is to strengthen you, the body of Christ. So thank you again for being with us today and listening and share these amazing messages with your friends and those who follow you on social media. Much love and I'll see you again.